Hi everyone, this is another episode of Cold as Girls. And my co-host for today is Leora, my daughter, Rachelle. And we have a special guest that we very admire, and that is Kasim Hafiz. So Leora, you introduced Kasim. Yes, so Kasim Hafiz. Uh, is a British citizen of Pakistani Muslim heritage who grew up being exposed to radical anti-Western, anti-Semitic, and anti-Israel ideas on a daily basis. During his teenage years, Kasim embraced a radical Islamic ideology and became very active in the anti-Israel movement. Thankfully, Alan Dershowitz's book, The Case for Israel, challenged Kasim's fundamental beliefs and caused him to undertake a period of research and reflection that led him to Israel, to visit Israel in 2007. Witnessing the true nature of the Jewish state changed Kasim's perception of Israel. He felt a moral obligation to publicly speak out for Israel on the dangers of radical Islam. He has spoken all over the world, including the 2013 Global Forum on Combating Anti-Semitism and before, and has also spoken before the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Kasim has appeared in on radio, television, and print media. And I personally met K- Kasim at my university at FAU, I think back in 2012 or 2013 at a speaking engagement that he gave. And when I read the bio, when I read, you know, what he was coming to speak about, I was immediately intrigued. I think Raina Axelbeard was also in charge of it. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I know you know her as well. Yeah. I've been following Kasim ever since then. And I'm a huge, we're huge fans and everything, you know, he does, we support and we're so grateful and thankful for, uh, for you as a person and what you do and, you know, for even coming and giving your time today to speak with us. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. And I can add no, to no, Thank you. Because Lior came home one o'clock in the morning, talking with friends afterwards, she said, mom, you need to hear this. And tomorrow he speaks at Donna Klein. And I had also a kid in Donna Klein. Still, I think, yeah. The Jewish school there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I said to my kids and my ex-husband, we need to go. And we all came and we asked some questions. He had a wonderful speech. And now we are here. And Rachelle is one of my friends in the group that I described that we are very from the Golden Girls. And she has heard you speaking too, Rachelle. Oh. Yeah, so Kasim, I had the pleasure of seeing you speak in a Chicago suburb, I don't remember which one, but I used to live in Chicago, um, at a synagogue uh, five, six, seven years ago. I don't remember exactly when. It might have been with Stand With Us. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But um, it was um, a fabulous speech. And I remember that you came in wearing a blue T-shirt, And I think on the back of it was a big star of David and it said, I'm a Zionist and everybody just melted. (laughs) So (laughs) it was wonderful. So, um, so anyway, um, so I'm glad to see you again. And um, I think it's great. So I admire what you've done and what you keep doing. I think it's wonderful. And can see, maybe you may ask, the story you spoke then about your life, how, if I remember it well, you were interested in becoming a suicide bomber, right? And you were like, okay, let yeah. me learn a little bit about Israel. Would you mind to tell that story? Because that is so mind-blowing. Sorry that you might, ha- might have done it already hundreds of times, but the whole world needs to know this. No, at all. I'm happy to. <clears throat> um, so firstly, thank you for having me on. It's really exciting. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I grew up in England, in Nottingham. Uh, my family came from England. Uh, sorry, my family came from Pakistan. You know, a very conventional Pakistani Muslim immigrant story, better economic opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I grew up in an area which was predominantly Pakistani and Muslim, which I think is very common for new immigrant communities, especially in a society which is so different from the society that they're coming from. And... <clears throat> While my family were observant Muslims, I, I honestly, I wouldn't say that they were extreme or radical, like genuinely. And and this may sound strange based on the next thing I'm about to say. 
because uh, while they weren't extreme or radical, like they came to British society wanting to be part of British society, but there was this anti-Semitism which was so extreme and very common in the community I grew up in. And what re- what's really interesting about that? There's two things. One, we were we're from Pakistan. Like Pakistan has no direct conflicts with Israel. It's not even near Israel. Uh, and two. We didn't have any contact with any sort of Jewish community in in Nottingham where I grew up. So there was this hatred that existed based on, you know, uh, on nothing substantial. And so it was always there. You know, my father would say things such as Hitler was a great man. He didn't kill enough Jews. Like the term Jew was used as an insult. And the term Israel and Jew were interchangeable. And, and you know, you'd hear the conspiracy theories that Jews control the media, the America, the UN, all these things, uh, which of course sound absurd right now if you talk about the media in the UN. Um, but what happened to me, I, I was growing up at a very interesting time for my generation where we were born in Britain. And Britain is very different from the United States. I've, I've lived in the United States for, well, I think like seven or eight years now. Um, and in in, in in England, at least, there is still this approach that to be British means still to be white. That is still a mentality that very much exists in England. And that's not been my experience in the United States. It's completely different. Like, I I, I identify more with being American than I ever did with being British in the short ter- time I've been here. Um, so you have this situation where you have people born in England who don't feel English. They go to Pakistan. They're not Pakistani either. So they're looking for belonging and into that kind of void step these extremist Islamist groups like Hezbollah Tahrir and, and groups like that, where they used basically this common thread of Islam because look, my grandparents' generation were terrified that the next generation would leave behind Islam living in the West. So it was very much ingrained into your every day. Uh, but you had these groups come in and use that as the, as a primary unifier for identity, that you're not British, you're not Pakistani, you're Muslim and you're Muslim first. And look, I'm not saying that necessarily is a bad thing, but in this context it was because these organizations were essentially creating this narrative that because we were Muslims living in the West, we were the victims of something. And it's an absurd... And look, you see it in the United States where... If you create a narrative that someone's a victim, but they're not really a victim, and there's no way to address the source of your victimhood, because when you're told you're a victim of Western society, like, who do you take that to? Like, there's no way to address that, or there's no way to fix it. So you get stuck in this cycle of hopelessness and extremism, because you, you always feel that no matter what you do, you're going to lose, and that makes you very susceptible to extremist groups. Um, And that's what you saw where I grew up. And it's interesting because these extremist groups didn't approach my grandparents, my parents' generation, because they had left countries like Pakistan where they had seen the damage extremist Islam does. But for us, where we're growing up in a society where we're not really fitting in, it it gave us something, it gave, it gave us a sense of belonging community. And what is at the core of so many of these Islamist movements is anti-Semitism. It is this enmity towards Israel and the Jews, this enmity towards the West. And, you know, we were, this is before social media, we, you know, you would get flyers and, and all these kind of things with extreme rhetoric and images on which we, you were told that this image is from Gaza or this is from, you know, Palestine or wherever. And look, it, it's the night. 1990s, you know, you're you're not going to fact check anything like anyone can print anything on anything and say this is from there. But what these emotional pictures do, and and you're seeing it today, you've seen it in the last six, seven months. When you see an image of a dead child or a child suffering, your instant reaction, your reaction is emotive and not rational. And that's not a bad thing, because we can all agree, regardless of where, regardless of who, children shouldn't be suffering. So you're given this very emotive image, which promotes an emotional reaction. But what these groups do and what these people who are pushing a narrative do, they then pivot that into hatred. So they go, okay, this is a dead child. 
they give you no context, there's no evidence, because a normal person doesn't ask if they're being lied to when they see a picture of a dead child. It's just not the normal, rational thing to do. So you're given this image, and then you're told this child was killed by the Israelis just for the sake of it. So you're taking this highly emotionally charged image, this graphic image, and then you're creating this idea that this was done by Israel, and oh. Israel must be evil because it's killing children for fun. Like, it's, it's very manipulative. Um, so, like, I grew up around that as a teenager, and there were two major turning points for me. One, 9-11 happened, and 9-11 was the first time I realized that I had kind of crossed the line in <clears throat> how I saw the world, because 9-11 was terrible, but the justification we made was this, that we made a justification. You know when you see thousands of people killed going to work one day, and you're going, this is bad, but you've crossed the line. Like, nothing can justify the murder of civilians going to work one day because of anything. So so that was one thing. The other thing was, again, you, know, you also had the Second Intifada happening at the same time. We were justifying that. But the, the thing that really crossed the line for me was I went to Pakistan in 2000 to visit family, and it was the first time I actually had seen a terrorist group up close, that lashkar e taiba or a Pakistani-based terror group. And it was interesting. Their rhetoric was vocal and violent and talked about destroying the enemies of Islam, India, and, and Israel, and America. And rather than being this is crazy and this is scary, as somebody who was born and raised in England, it was almost empowering. And that's kind of how this, this works. It, they, the same extremists create this victim narrative, and then they present themselves as the solution. And because you have really invested and, and bought into this idea that you are a, a victim, you are now justifying things that you wouldn't normally justify. Let's go they were kill civilians all the time. But you, you start to make excuses. You go, yes, they kill civilians but we're the bigger victims. Yes, they do this, but when you look at what's happening in Kashmir or Palestine, you can understand why it's happening. So when I got back from Pakistan from that trip, I started looking more into Lashkar Taiba. Again, it all goes back to this kind of well of anti-Semitism. It's like a gateway drug. Like, honestly, if somebody asked me what the, the gateway drug for radical Islam is, it's anti-Semitism and, and anti-Zionism. They're the same thing. But they really are the gateway drugs for these extremist ideologies. And I became very active in the anti-Israel movement in my community, on college campuses, when I went to college. And I got to this point, which I feel all extremist groups do, and any sort of extremism, like even if we're talking about like gangs in, in a city, they're constantly pushing you to see to what extreme that you're willing to go. And for me, you know, having seen 9-11, having seen 7-7, it seemed like the logical step to commit an act of terrorism. Like that actually made a statement. And I firmly believed in what I believed. So that was the decision I had made. I'd go back to Pakistan. I'd go to a terrorist training camp. And then, you know, having a British passport, I could travel to Israel and do whatever I had to do. Uh, thankfully, that didn't happen. And it, and it started, as you reference, me coming across a book called The Case for Israel. I picked up this book with this arrogance that I knew everything. And as I started reading it, it, it raised very basic issues if you have a over if you ha if you know the history the the points that the case for israel raises are very basic but for me who had been this in this echo chamber the idea of the jewish people being indigenous to the land of israel the idea of the jewish presence in the land of israel going back thousands of years the idea that you know the, the zionists had agreed to every single partition plan, it was the Arab leaders who didn't. The idea that Israel was a democracy and all these things. And this was, it, it was like being told that an alien life form existed. That's how extreme and out of kind of the ordinary this was for me. So that didn't change everything because it's not like you read one book. When, you, when you're at a point when you're willing to kill people and you've celebrated people being murdered, you don't read one book and be like, huh, got it wrong. You know, who knew? It doesn't work like that. So I started doing a little bit more research just to confirm that I was right. And the more I researched, the more I found that what I believe didn't add up. But it's very difficult to just give that up when your whole identity is built around this hatred. And that led me to go to Israel in 2007. Again, it wasn't this journey of finding out the truth. It was this journey to 
to validate my own hatred and see all these evil things. And then I could carry on and do what I, you know, believed was right. Um, and that trip changed everything. So, yeah. You know, Kasim, if I could interrupt for one second, one of the stories that you shared uh, at that synagogue in Chicago was hilarious. It was about your experience when you arrived in Israel and how you were questioned. If you don't mind going into that, I think it's really interesting and delightful. No, of course. Uh, so I had never traveled alone anywhere. I'm like 23, I want to say, or 24. I'd never traveled overseas alone. You know, I'd been to Pakistan and all these other places. So just common sense for me. I, I looked up the home office, which is the equivalent of the State Department in England, and it had travel advice. And for Israel, it was, you know, be honest if you're ever questioned, unique security situation, et cetera, et cetera. So here I am, I land in Mangorian. I don't know anyone in Israel. I literally had just like booked a, a flight and I got a hotel. Like it was like, that was it. So I get to the airport and I hand up my passport. And, you know, if you've ever been to Ben Gurion, they ask, like, what is the purpose of your visit? So I was very honest. I was like, look, and, you know, a little bit anti-Semitic. I don't really like Israel. So I thought I'd come and see it for myself. Uh, and that's how I ended up spending eight hours in security <laughs> and being questioned. Uh, but yeah, look, look, eight hours is a long time. Uh, but I will say it, it wasn't a bad experience. Firstly, first time I'd ever spoken to an Israeli. So, you know, there was that. Um, but like he would ask me questions. It, it, look, it's what I call like the, you know, you have good cop, bad cop. He did this with, like good cop Jewish mother thing where it'd be like, where are you planning on going? I'd explain where like I wanted to visit. And then he'd be like, you should really eat something. I'm like, I'm good. Thank He's like, no, 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 you should eat something. And like, that happened a lot and he would just bring food regardless of whether I said yes or no. Um, and then, you know, he was looking for my passport and at the time, um, my passport was maybe a few months old. My old one had expired and he's like, look, there are no stamps and no visas. It's very suspicious that the first time, you know, you as somebody who's British of a Pakistani heritage has traveled out of Great Britain, it's to Israel. Like you can understand how that looks. I'm like, no, no, no. Look, my passport is new. I've traveled before. And he goes, you know, where are you being? I've been like, I go to Pakistan all the time. He's like, okay, like, why? I explained family. He went, is that the only country in the region you've been? I'm like, no, no, no. I went to Saudi Arabia four years ago. And he's like, oh, okay. So it was, yeah. So we went back and forth. But yeah, eventually I was allowed into Israel. <laughs> so, but yeah. Yeah. So, and then, and then what did you do then? You were walking yeah. around and you were looking for Israeli Arabs and you were very concerned. Yeah. And can you talk about that? Sure. Like, this is still one of the most, I mean, I, when I it's been years since I spoke at FAU. Uh, but to this day, this is still one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done. So, like, I'm walking around. I see this uh, very obviously uh arab muslim couple the woman has a headscarf on so like i kind of like like and it makes me laugh like i i it's embarrassing but i laugh because i think of kind of you know what's happening on college campuses and these college students who think they know everything and i'm like stop it's embarrassing like what are you doing uh so i go over to this couple and i'm like you know very sincerely i'm like it must be so difficult for you here Guy has no idea, like, what, like, uh, guy first, like, I'm like, assalamu alaikum, he responds, I'm like, it must be so difficult for you here. And he's like, like, takes a step back, and it's like, I, what are you talking about? In English, he responds in English. And the British thing we do when we think that somebody doesn't understand what we're saying, we say it again slower and louder, even if the person responds in, in perfect English. So I ask it again. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And I, I, I like launch into this very like corny kind of speech about this apartheid and all these things and everything. And he stops me and he goes, look, are things perfect for me living as, a, as an Arab in Israel? No. But are things perfect for you, whatever country you're from? Uh, you know, I'm like, well, we're not really talking about where I'm from. Um, and he explains, he goes, look, this is my home. I'm glad this is my home. Like, this is the only place in this region where I'm safe, that my wife can go to work and come back, and I don't have to worry about her not coming home. 
like you don't understand this country and you're not helping a normal person would have been like okay he lives here he obviously gets it me i was like well he doesn't know what he's talking about so <laughs> but that was impactful like it, it, it that was actually really impactful but in the moment it was just it's very surprising because you really do believe you know everything like without having stepped foot in the country without having spoken to the people that you live it you genuinely think that you're an expert it's it's kind of crazy yeah you did it one time you did it more times did you you went over to more so, you no know, i spoke to a number of people i met somebody drews for the first time and it was again it was just a, a similar situation like even like going into the shuk in Jerusalem, it's like Jews and Arabs working together. And just, you know, like they all have like the same complaints, like public transportation isn't very good. Uh, like taxes are too high, rent is too high, but hey, like, you know, it could be worse. It was just very, it's just, I don't know. I, I don't know what I expected now thinking back, but it was just very, I guess very normal would be the, the way to describe it. So, so yeah, so it was, it took, it, it, it took a lot because you're like taking all this in and it's still very, because you still have this belief that this is like the most evil place on earth and that's not what you're experiencing. So it, it, it it's just, it was like a very like surreal experience. How long did you stay? Like two weeks or so? Yeah, I was there for just over two weeks. Um, and like the, the turning point for me, like the moment where I was like, okay, I've got this wrong, was at the Western Wall. Like I, obviously I'm not Jewish. I'd been to Saudi Arabia, like I said. So in like Mecca and Medina, there are signs where non-Muslims are not allowed within the Jewish, like the kind of, uh, the bounds of those cities. It, it's an old Islamic law. So I don't know like what the deal is with the Western Wall, but I'm like, I'm in Jerusalem, so I, like I go to the Western Wall. Again, I know a little bit about Judaism, not a lot. Like I know the Western Wall is important. So I'm walking towards the Western Wall. I go through the metal detectors, there's no issues. I'm like, okay, what am I doing? And there's like the Chabad people with tefillin, and I have no idea what that is. I was like, no, thank you. Like, I was like, uh -uh, I'm not interested. I don't know what this is. Um, but like i'm at the western wall and it really was, was kind of it's look even i've told this story many times and it is a little bit cliche but it really was this kind of moment of clarity like life is noisy like our own thoughts everything and there was just this moment where i was able to kind of step back and go just take everything in everything that i experienced in that day alone and realize that i'd got it wrong and realize that i made a huge mistake and you know, I made a decision that rather than just, you know, be like, oh, my God, I made a mistake. It's the end of the world. Like, I'm still here. I have time here. Let me understand this country more. Let me understand the people more. And then I can figure out, like, what happens next. And, you know, the decision I made when I went back was I have to speak up. And 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 that's it wasn't like I didn't want like by nature. I'm not an activist. Like I like I'm just like, all right live your life, man. I, I, don't, I don't care. And th this didn't start off like that. It just started with me trying to have conversations with friends and family. And it just kind of went from there. And yeah, and that's, we're here now, like 14, a, a lot of my math is terrible, but many years later. So Kasim, I wanted to ask you, um, once you returned home from Israel and reported your experience, what you saw, what people said. Uh, did you manage to change the hearts and minds of any of your friends and family? So some, one of the biggest challenges, and, and look, I'll be honest, it was minimal. One of the biggest challenges, and this to this day frustrates me, I don't care if you disagree with me. That's fine. Like if you have a well-reasoned argument, let me hear it and let's talk about it. It was people did not want to hear it. And that, like, you know, this is 2007, so it's a long time ago. But the fact that even then, rather than, rather than going, okay, this is a person who was militantly opposed to Israel, who has now gone by themselves, made a decision, paid for the trip, and now has an experience to share. Let me at least hear that. Because I've never been to the region. I may never go to the region. There was just this, we do not want to hear it at all. It was like dealing with children, where they like put their 
fingers in their ears. And that was just incredibly frustrating. Like people made judgments and decisions based on, I, I have no idea based on what, but they just would not engage. And the ones who did engage, look, the ones who did engage and we had like meaningful conversations, would I say they became pro-Israel? Probably not, but they moved from being anti-Israel. And that's just one of the, the challenges. Like this is, it is, it's something that has taken on a life of its own. Because like when I first got back, I didn't expect the backlash that I got because I grew up with a very strong grounding in Islamic theology. Like I would lead prayers at my mosque. I would do the call to prayer. Like I knew my faith. This, what I did not see me going, actually Israel isn't evil as being something which was attacking Islam or Muslims because it simply isn't. But it's become intertwined with this idea that like if you are a Muslim and if you don't side with the Palestinians, there's something wrong with you. It's It's been turned into a theological element in many ways where it really shouldn't be because Islam forbids nationalism of any sort. Yeah. So that your family accepted it or were there obstacles? Was your, how was your own family dealing with that? There were a lot of obstacles. Like, I don't speak to much of my family now. And, you know, part of the reason I moved initially to Canada was, look, I grew up in that same community. I lived in that same community. And then uh, literally overnight, you find out that you are no longer welcome. And, you know, you start getting death threats and, and all these things. And I was just like, I do not want to live like this. Like, I have a choice. I can either stop speaking or I have to move. And like, I could, you can't see the truth and then make a decision not to talk about it. Because look, I look, whether you're religious or not, whatever you believe, I think we're all accountable for what we do, whether it's in this life or a next life or whatever it is. And look, I was responsible for spreading lies and hatred. I've seen the damage that it does. I have a responsibility to speak out against it. So Unfortunately, my family weren't receptive. And again, it's that same thing. Rather than engaging, they just chose to make a decision that somehow I was wrong. Hmm. That's also painful in a way, right? Yeah. And then you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then you moved to America. And what are you doing now? I mean, you are active in Dubai. Yeah. You so I am. Um... Oh, sorry. Uh... No, 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 no. Would you like to tell a little bit more? Uh... Yeah. Oh, sure. So I work for Christians United for Israel. Uh, we are the largest pro-Israel group in America. We have 10 million members. Uh, I have been there for nine years. Uh, so what's interesting about Kufa and one of the things that really stood out for me, there are two things. One, there is such a huge base of people outside of the Jewish community that we need to reach. Uh, because the Jewish community is tiny globally, not just in America, it's a tiny community. But what was really important for me about Kufi, which I really respect, is we are 100% non-conversionary. We are not trying to convert anybody. We're a one-issue organization, and that is standing with Israel and standing against anti-Semitism. That's it. That's so cool. we, yeah, like it's that's that's all we do. Um, and we have, you know, we have member staff who are Jewish. Uh, one of our co-executive directors is Jewish, and. We work on multiple levels. We have a campus division who works on campuses. We have uh, the national organization which works with churches. We have a lobbying arm which works to push legislation. One of the most recent ones, which was a huge effort. Uh, in a couple of days, we mobilized over 250 leaders from all over the country to come to DC when the Israel aid bill had stalled and that bill then passed. Um, so th there's multiple things we do. We take pastors to Israel. We do educational materials. We have taken Christian influencers and young leaders to Israel. Um, so it, it is a huge effort, um, but it, it's important. Not only it, it's important threefold. One, it's important for the American-Israel relationship. It's important for the future of the United States. And it's important for the Jewish community in the United States and all over the world to know that they're not alone. Yeah, I actually had the honor of um, going to a Kufi annual DC event. 
And it was mind blowing. It was amazing to me uh, how strongly pro-Israel um, this organization is. And uh, it was just beautiful to see people from all kinds of backgrounds, black, white, Hispanic, whatever, Asian, together for Israel in the most like really, really strong way. And people who were not well off donating as much money as they could, um, yeah. just being so generous. It, it was really very, it, it was very special. Yeah, it's I. It's one thing which is very, very special about our annual conference. We I think it's the last week of July this year. One of the things I've just experienced in the time I've been there is, you know, there are so many people that I meet. You know, everyone. I mean, we have people from Hawaii and from Alaska and from Idaho, like all over the country, every background, and it's so incredible for me to meet people who. This issue is so important to them. These are these are Christians. This issue is so important to them that this is their one vacation. Like they come to our conference, and that is that will be their their vacation for the year. And they will come in a few days earlier, and maybe like spend some time in DC. But it's so important for them to be there. And it's just I don't know. It's really inspiring to see that. And it's so easy just to see all the darkness and all of the negativity and all these things. But, you know, we have events all over the country every single day. Obviously, nothing compares to the annual conference because it's huge. But every single day, you know, I was literally in Sacramento a few weeks ago. We had an event there. Like, we are doing events every single day. Um, so people hear this message and people understand why it's so important for Christians and others to stand with Israel. Yeah, it's, it's so nice to hear about people that are truth. Speaking and, and, and support us in that because it's so lacking in many ways today as it's visible for everyone. Yeah. So, well, thank you so very much for doing all that. But it's, I think also it's always zoomed into the negative. Like, you always hear about, like, you don't hear as much about um, people that are pro Israel so often. So, it's good to hear that. And yeah. As far as like organizing, yeah. it's so important. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. I don't know. It's wonderful. You go regularly to Israel sometimes to speak, or are you mainly say in America or other places in the world? It varies. We take a lot of trips uh, to Israel. We take pastors, uh, and I've, I've been on some of the trips I've led. Me and a colleague last year, we led a trip of special forces veterans. Uh, we took them to Israel. We... Uh, the year before that, one of the trips we did in Israel, it, ended up, it was really interesting. We went to Israel. I can't remember what it what It was for a trip. And then the dead, two days before I was going to fly back to the United States, one of my directors goes, hey, are you willing to go to Hungary t tomorrow? I was like, Hungary? Why? <sighs> like the Hungary-Ukraine border. So Kufai partnered with the Jewish agency when the Ukraine war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and we worked with the Jewish agency to bring thousands of Ukrainian Jews into Hungary then to make Aliyah to Israel. So, so that was a, a really interesting experience, kind of being on a plane with new immigrants from Ukraine, predominantly women and the elderly because of Ukraine's rules in terms of during the war, who can leave. So that was just really special, like to be on that flight when they start a new life in Israel. Yeah, that is true. It's amazing. So you seem to really be surrounded with positive, loving, and nice people with good intentions. And that, that is also wonderful. As, <laughs> that's a great way to live. You're as well. No, it really is. Yeah, you're in a yeah. mission. Yeah, and you change from Islam into Christianity. It is also yeah. an, an interesting process. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, I mean, I never, I, I, it's interesting. Like I, I kind of had a time where I was just done with religion in general. And then I was like, ah, oh, that doesn't make, I can't really reconcile the idea that there is nothing. Uh, Christianity, I never would have like, honestly, Christianity was never, I didn't, I didn't think I'd, if somebody had asked me 10 years ago or even 
eight years ago, will you become a Christian? I was like, there's no chance. Absolutely no chance. But hey, so. Where are you designing this then? So you really make interesting choices. <laughs> right. Like, apparently, yeah. Great Britain. And then Zionist, like I saw it in your Instagram, because of course we follow you on Instagram. What does the Thank number you. 22 mean for you? Are you into numerology? No, it used to be my soccer jersey number. <laughs> <I've followed laughs> oh, that's so that's funny. funny. <laughs> yeah. The 20, yeah, I'm, I look at numbers often. The 22nd, we may. Yeah. My, my children. And oh, I nice. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, we go to do some volunteer work. We go to see some family and. Uh, yeah, so we can see what they can do wedding. and a wedding too. Also, some oh, nice. Yeah, wonderful. that's really exciting. Yeah, it is. We wanted to ask one more question. Do we want to ask about like what do you see in the future? Like, what do you think? Like, what was the yeah. question exactly? Ask, I don't ask. Like, what do you see happening? New different. Israel. Like, what was the question? I don't remember. It's hard, to, it, Leora. It's hard to hear you. Oh, can okay. you talk a little? We were talking yesterday about like questions to ask, and we wanted to ask what like you foresee like you know as an activist like do you foresee like even if it's not the answer we want to hear like what are, what are your thoughts on the future for israel the future on you know even in america with what's happening like do you think things are going to be leaning towards a you know positive outcome like i don't know for israel yeah for, for israel, israel. yeah yeah, yeah. that's the idea uh yeah. Um, wow, that's a, a good question. Um, honestly, I am not just being an optimist. I really do think it will become positive. I think it's going to be difficult for a long time. I don't think this is just going to... And this is why I tell anybody who's involved in this space, if you're Jewish, if you're Israeli, if you're a Zionist, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Like This isn't going to end overnight, and you can't be engaged in this every single day because it's just not going to be good for your own personal health. You know, like, so make sure you have community and, and friends or whatever you need, like, and it's okay to take time out for yourself. Like, I, I know a few, a lot of people feel guilty because they want to do something. I, I get it. But I, I do think there'll be positives. I think that the level of vitriol and hatred we've seen from the anti-Israel activists has woken a lot of people up. Because, look, there's one thing chanting to the river, from the river to the sea, which is abhorrent and wrong and a call for genocide. I'm not denying that. But what is, but it's woken up a lot of Americans to see that people chanting death to America in America. Like ultimately, most Americans are going to care about America. And like, you know, we see these things in New York and, and all these things. And that's not the whole country. Like there are a lot of parts of this country, be it in parts of Florida or Idaho or wherever, where people are still deeply patriotic about America. They still care about the Israel-America relationship. They still care about these, you know, Judeo-Christian values, but these are all really important. And we always see that the, the loudest people are never the majority. Like, they're just loud and obnoxious and, like, need to take a shower. Like, it's just, it's a lot. Um, Ice cold. Uh, like, yeah. You know, like, it's, yeah. so I, I think, I think there's a lot of positives that will come long term. It's just going to take a moment. And I think that, you know, more people need to just find their voice. And I think for Israel, I think Israel has gone through a trauma and it's going to go through a healing process because right now, Israel and Israelis and the Jewish community, they can't heal because they're still living through that trauma. The war is still happening. There are still hostages. So, so you can't heal because it's, it's still every day. There are soldiers being killed in battle. So I think Israel needs to go through a healing process when, whenever this kind of comes to a conclusion, when Hamas is hopefully gone and, and the hostages are back. I don't know what time that timeline looks like. It could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. Like We really don't know. I think Israel needs to go through a healing process. And I think that Israel will do what it has done throughout its history. It will th thrive, it will overcome, and it will, it will become stronger. It, it's, it's been, like, I went to Israel in December, and it was, you know, I've been to Israel so many times, but December was just different. It, it, everything felt different. Yeah. But, you know, even with all the negative, it was still inspiring to see Israelis united, Israelis 
still caring about each other. And remember, like this is coming on the back of like the massive protests that they were having in Israel just months before October 7th. And I think that's something special about Israelis and the Jewish people, where they realize that, yes, there are all these political discussions that are happening, but this is more important. This is what matters. And I, I do think Israel will emerge from this stronger. I think Israel will emerge from this definitely different. And I really think it will be... I think we'll also see a lot of positive changes in the Middle East. Yeah. So. You are hopeful with the Abram Accords, right? And you right. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. Like, think about it. Like, in 19... If you'd said to somebody in 1974, one day the president of Egypt will be speaking in the Knesset, like, within a decade, you would have thought they were insane because you'd just fought a war against Egypt. So, like... The Middle East is an interesting place, and it is changing. And the Abraham Accords, like you said, they they have changed a lot. And you know, I think we're seeing Saudi Arabia wanting to make changes. And it's it, one of the one of the one of Israel's I guess tragedies is that Israel has not been able to dictate its own future and path because so many link what Israel does to that the situation with the Palestinians. Whereas any other country can pick its diplomatic relations and like go, okay, we want an agreement based on this and trade and whatever. With a lot of countries where Israel engages, they'll say, but what about the Palestinians? So it, it's a catch-22. But I sincerely think that, that things will shift. And I, I'm really hopeful. Like, genuinely, I'm really hopeful. And I think that we will see a really a time of prosperity for Israel in in many ways, not just economically, but also just in terms of its relationship in the Middle East. And I think we will see the changing of the Middle East. It's going to be gradual. It's not going to be overnight because you have some very ingrained, hard opinions within the Middle East. The Middle East is not Europe and it's not North America. And I think that American diplomats need to really acknowledge that because I think that's where we constantly fail. We look at the Middle East through a Western run lens. Yeah. But I think that there is a great deal of potential. Yeah. I'm so happy to hear that because it's nice to hear a positive sound, right? And as right. I have to are you ever invited to speak as the way you think as an activist in one of the Muslim countries in the Middle East? Are you are they ever inviting you to speak? Like in no. <laughs> um not yet. No, not at this point. I like it. no. I've spoken to a lot of college campuses, and like I'll have a lot of Muslim students come. But look, I, I, you know, the Middle East is slowly changing, and who knows? Anything is possible, and I, I genuinely believe that. I think anything is possible, and there are there are people, and in, in, in a lot of Muslim countries, you know, with younger demographics who are kind of like, okay, like now where do we go? Like we we've, we've constantly believed this. How about if there's more? You know, if you look at Iran and the, the young people in Iran. And I think also, I didn't mention this before, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't add this. You know, with everything we've seen in the United States, like, I'm really excited for the future of the Jewish community in America. Because the students that have stood up and spoke out in really difficult circumstances, students should be able to just go to college and go do whatever... I'm not going to tell them to get drunk or anything, but we know what students do <laughs> and get their degree and like go home. But they've not been able to do that. And they have stood up and they have spoken up and they have shown leadership, with, which they should never have had to, but they have. And I think that is really inspiring for the future of the Jewish community in America. Like they're going to be tomorrow's leaders. They're going to be tomorrow's parents. And it's, it's crazy that this situation was forced upon them. But so many of them showed a lot of courage. And I think that's really heartening. And, and it shows that, you know, a lot of parents, a lot of parents have been doing a great job. Wow, that's Because great. when it mattered, they stood up. That, that is great to hear that too. And I agree with you. It's always that middle of that big battle between submitting to your fear. Do you do, right? Or do you do something? And a lot of people right. battle that fight. Because it's a lot of right. fear. And I'm a huge Not advocate. Yourself. Get out of your fear. Do what you can. And because it's needed. It's for everybody. You know? For every... Yeah. Right. So, 
Oh, thank you so much. Oh, it was so you. awesome to have you. And it, I really personally touched that you have this positive outlook because we lack that a little bit, right? I really, <laughs> I feel like I'm not sure, but you know, it's it is so like without a uh, yeah, almost like when is this over? There's no end to this war and uh, all the right. same thing. It's it's just horrible. And, and all that. But it's interesting because yeah, we know that the media is uh, not so positively oriented and it makes me have to, often laugh. They say, oh, the Jews control the media. Well, if we did, it would, totally, it would have totally... <laughs> right. It's like one of the... It's still believed, right? You still hear that. Right. Yeah, I'm afraid that in the, indeed anti-Semitism is inherited and you gave an excellent example about it too. We are from, from the Netherlands originally, so I can very much relate to what you say about Great Britain, your experiences, what I have seen with my Muslim friends in the Netherlands. And um, yeah. whereas if, if everybody would want peace, the world would be so nice, I think. Right, no, 100%. Opportunity. There's so much opportunity, yeah. So now we are going to start our round of anti-summit of the week. And I would like Michelle to start with that. Okay, so mine was Biden's biggest donors who are responsible for funding the pro-Palestinian protesters. George Soros, he's always in our talk somehow. He always manages to get in there. Rockefeller and the Pritzkers. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the name Pritzker, he's the left-wing governor of Illinois. And he's done a great job to totally destroy the place. Uh, so that's who I chose as my anti-Semite. There's a few of them in there. Unfortunately, there are more than one, yeah. So, Lior, what would be yours? Right. An anti-Semite, but... She's speaking up against her girl now, which is very disappointing, but I've heard that Amal Clooney now is, um, yeah, she's on this, she's, I think she's been speaking, I have to check and double check it, but I saw on Sheila Nazarian's page that today she was speaking out against Israel in the national court against, oh, Israel, the Hague. I don't know, yeah, the Hague, yeah, that, yeah. So that was really disappointing. Yes. I loved the city I got married. Ah. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Huh. Yeah. Oh, well. Let's see what would be yours. Um, it's going to have to be Macklemore. Like, he is just the worst. Like, his song is terrible. Also, he said Kufi wrong. He called us Kufi in his song, which bothered me. Um. Also, he's just an anti-Semite and pretends he isn't. He, like, has not said anything about anything going on in the world, but decided to, like, chime into this. So, yeah, he sucks. His music sucks. Anti-Semitism sucks. Yeah. Well, thank you. I take a group of people because it still bothers me, and that's the United Nations that still try to cover up with UNRWA and don't want to really reveal how UNRWA was helping uh, with also keeping hostages, planning everything out, celebrating also, Hold and on. teaching so much hate to the children. What about them all standing for a minute's silence today to commemorate the death of Raisi, the president of Iran? I mean, what's going on? I think that's yeah, that's my anti Semite. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, collection. That is so huh? terrible. That, that is so terrible. And I could also say the feminist movement of yet the Western world, America and, uh, and Europe, and so to say loyalty to women, not to the women of Iran, but also not to the women of Israel. Uh, the, the whole thing that really bothers me a lot. You know, and I, I, one of the things that I appreciate so much in you, because you, Kasim, you come from a place of love and kindness and warmth and honesty. And I wish that more people were like that. And I really appreciate that. I think you're a very special person. Yeah, I really believe mm, Thank you. you. I'm not pleasing you at the end, but I really mean that. No. You need no, more. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So, wow, let's go to the hero because that is more nice. Rachel. So, my heroes were all the beautiful, brave, young Israeli soldiers who died fighting for Israel. Yeah, yeah. May their lives be a blessing. 
but still a memory. Okay, New York. So my hero, I would say, you know, hearing you speak today about, you're obviously our hero, but also those people that are standing behind us, those Christians, those people of other faiths that are brave enough to stand up and, and you know, say something or, you know, just them supporting Israel and having our back. Just, it's. Yeah, I wanted so to support yeah. the truth. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They are in a difficult position, absolutely. Yeah, I would like to memorize Adam Golan, who was the Israeli candidate for singing in the Europe, 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 Europe Vision <laughs> Festival, <laughs> some festival. I loved her song, that's one thing, but um, her, her courage and seeing the picture that she was transported with like 100 cars and the helicopter over her. And I cannot find it more than ridiculous that I need that it is needed. I'm grateful that they protect it. But oh my gosh, how far are we from normal? We need to be so like that. And she took it all in and she was cursed at and yelled at. And yeah. So that is my hero. Well, Thank you very yes, much. Thank you. We wish you all Kasim. the best, Kasim. Stay it's safe. So and appreciate you taking and this time. One day we will see you again yes. because we are in Miami. Who knows? Yeah, we'll let us again. know when you're ever in Miami. Yeah. We'll be there. Front because row. Listen. No, we'll do. How can we, can we sign sure. coffee? All how, of us? how can we do that? Is it can we be on a certain list? Can we follow you? I, I, we do that, of course, on Instagram. How can we know where you are speaking? Is there any way that we could know? Have to know that. I will post it post on Instagram. If I ever do, I will post on Instagram. Okay. We will see you. Thank you so very much and have a beautiful rest of the, uh, the day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Christine. You too. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.